Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to have a webinar on Build It Right. This is a, uh, a webinar about planning the layer barn of for today and the future. We're going to share our considerations when building a new barn, uh, right from the, the building, the equipment, and through the egg room. We're going to look at what, what we have today and future considerations. The agenda for today will be an introduction and review of the requirements by myself. We'll look into the layout of the equipment, the enriched and cage-free by myself and, and Bryant Wiley. We'll look at the building with Marty Jones and Mark Doyle, and the egg handling equipment with J.D. Williamson. One of the most important things that we want to stress today is the most important tool the people that come to work for you on your farm that they should use is their ears and their ability to listen and communicate with each other. It's a very important process, and it's important that all the people that are involved are involved right from the start. There are many factors to consider when looking for a new building. Um, involve everyone early. Find a group of suppliers that you can trust and work together as a group. And you know, that'll become obvious as we go through this today. Think of, think of the future costs of expansion and the way you'd like to expand at the start of the building. It can be, you can save a lot of money in the long run by thinking that way. And make sure you meet the regulations. The Canadian regulations were brought forth in 2016 and brought forth by a panel of experts and this thing has been staged in, in introduction. So slowly we're seeing the, code of, the new code of practice for pullets and layer hens coming forward. And there we're, excuse me, we're seeing this happen as we move away from conventional cages, as they are slowly being phased out into new types of housing. As you can see, this graph will show you that the move is on. In 2012, almost all the birds were housed in conventional cages. By 2014, we'd started to move a little bit with green being the conventional cages, brown being the enriched, and the red color being the aviary. And by the projection for right now, as you can see, is that enriched, case, enriched housing um, is by far the most popular new type of housing, followed by the aviary, and conventional cages are down to about 60%. For enriched housing, you need one water nipple per 12 birds. You need 116 and a quarter inches per bird of, of cage space. That includes the nest space. The minimum head space in a cage has to be 17.7 .7 inches. You must have 5.9 inches of per spa perch space per bird, 3.7 inches of feeder space per bird, and the nest space must be 10 square inches per bird. You also must have 4.8 square inches per bird of scratch area. Here's some of the new enriched housing that we see in the field. Uh, this is actually an Ontario farm. In the aviary or free run systems, again, the head space has to be 17.7 .7 inches. You need one, one water nipple per 12 birds. You need 144 square inches of equipment, uh, equipment and floor space. And for that floor space to count, you have to have 17.7 .7 inches above the floor so that for that floor space to count. Anything less than that, the floor space doesn't count. You have to have 5.9 inches of perch space per bird and 20% of it has to be above 15.7 inches. You must have 3.7 inches of feeder space per bird and 33% of the usable space must be litter or scratch area. Uh, this is a, an aviary barn as well, fully populated with brown birds. So when you're, the considerations that you'd have for your enhanced housing or your enriched housing, um, your enriched housing, the way the barn's laid out can change the overall function of the barn. Make, the one thing you have to make sure is that the aisles are wide enough for two cards to pass for, for populating and depopulating. Leave extra room at the front of the, and the back of the barn. 
leave room above the equipment. You need to think about your lighting program as it's very important in, in making this equipment operate properly. And again, think about your expansion in the future if needed. The aisle widths are important. When you're looking at the layout of the equipment, the space between the two rows is very important. You need 42 inches to make sure that those carts can pass during population and depopulation. When you're using the combi equipment, which are cages that start off as enriched housing but have the ability to become an aviary, it's important that you leave the aisles wide enough so that it works properly as an aviary. The space between the aisles is incredibly important in an aviary. We recommend a minimum of 50 inches, but we ask you to think about 60 inches at least. If you don't do that, the, renewer, the manure will get wet, it will build up in the aisleways, and won't get a chance to get pushed under the system by the birds and have the manure taken out. That'll lead to many different problems. Also, it'll lead to the way the birds get in and out of the system having problems. Here's just a, a quick look at the, the layout of those barns of just straight enhanced equipment. You can see that the aisles here, we've got 42.45 inches. Um, this is uh, one of our systems that has the troughs on the outside. And that's from the edge of the trough to the edge of the trough. The space in front of the back of the in front of the barn at the back of the barn is always is also important. The space you leave at the front of the back of the barn is your way we use our buildings. We have we're tempted to make this area as small as possible, but we need to have we don't want to minimize that space. It should leave 10 feet in front of the egg elevators to allow space to work and um, for movement of carts and a staging place for carts for for population and depopulation. You should leave a, minute, a minimum of 10 feet at the back of the barn uh, be, so you can easily clean your manure system, get around it to repair it. The room above the equipment. The room above the equipment is really important. You should leave a minimum of three feet above the top row. This allows for better ventilation and allows freer movement of air. With summers getting hotter and hotter, it's important to have good strong ventilation to keep airflow moving. So we should really consider having three feet minimum. The lighting. The lighting is important to make sure that the, the birds use the nest space properly, what we call nest acceptance. That leads to really high um, maximizing egg quality. As you can see in the picture on the right, this is a, a system that's actually in Ontario that's lit with in-cage lighting. You can see that we have two nests back to back in this area. That area has no lighting at all, and we light the caged areas. So we have two back-to-back -back caged areas, two back-to-back -back nest areas. Birds want it to be dark and private to accept the nest and make sure that the eggs are laid there. If they're laid in the nest, they don't have a chance to get stepped on or pecked. It really does lead to maximizing egg quality. This barn, the only lights when people aren't, aren't in the barn is only the cage lights. Future considerations when you're looking at um, an enriched housing barn. With, as the industry grows and quote allocations are given, the size of the barns today never seems to be big enough. You have to look at what's the least expensive way to expand that barn. When you order your system, you should think about how you're going to do this. I've given an example of, of one thing that some of the manufacturing equipment manufacturers can do. The, the barns have left their three feet of minimum ventilation space, but they've also added space to add an extra tier of equipment. That is a rather inexpensive way to expand your barn by 25%. As you can see the pictures below, we've gone from three tiers to four tiers. But it is important that you talk to your equipment manufacturer at the start and talk to them exactly about this. For example, egg elevators are much cheaper 
to order for that fourth tier at the start than they are to add on to. So if you're thinking of expanding up, spend a little extra money, talk to your equipment manufacturer so that they can make the, the considerations at the start and have it a much cheaper way to go. If you need to add length to the barn, that's something that the people from Agricon, as we go through this, will be talking about in, in, in much deeper detail. Again, there's the pictures that were on the bottom of that last slide. You can see all we've done there is taken that extra headspace that we've left in the barn and added an extra tier of equipment. It's a fast way to add 25% um, of your, sorry, 33% uh, space to your barn and easily expand fairly inexpensively. But if you don't do it, it's hard to add to the space in the walls. In the aviary housing, at this point, I'm gonna ask um, my colleague, Bryant Wiley, who's a regional sales manager for Big Dutchman in the US to join me. And he's gonna be talking as we go through as well. The factors to look at in the aviary housing, the way the barn equipment is laid out, change the overall function of the, gar the barn. Again, the aisle width is very important. Leave extra room at the front and the back of the barn. Talk about, think about your lighting program and think about how you'll expand in the future. And Bryant, if I could have you just go through the aisle width, please. Aisle width. So when laying out equipment inside the barn, uh, the space between rows is very important. Uh, there, there's a couple guidelines we like to follow and, and also recommend uh, when laying out this equipment. Uh, minimum, you know, Ron hit on it earlier, 60 inches. Uh, the narrow aisles will hurt manure quality and build up, uh, which overall hurts your, your performance. Um, perfect world, I like to see six feet on the outside aisles and eight feet on the inside. So the reasoning uh, for that is, is actual floor space. It's crucial for the birds to scratch and perform those natural behaviors. Uh, the large aisle spaces also will allow your, your barn managers to inspect the flock. So to continue on uh, with, with proper, nice wide aisle spacing, uh, you know, it overall uh, switches to uh, litter. L loose dry litter is very important in your aviary. Uh, like, I, like I just mentioned, birds need to dust bathe, they need to scratch, uh, which overall they, they need a dry space to occupy time. Uh, wet litter, it will also carry over in the system and then build up throughout the life of the flock. Keeping wet litter and litter build up out of your nest box uh, is very important. Uh, this will impact your nest acceptance, which will lead to more mislaid eggs and increased dirts and cracks you are really after the cleanest nest pad possible. Again, so this nest area, that is your money maker. Uh, you want that, that area clean, dry, safe, secure for those birds uh, to really seek out that nest and, and lay their eggs. Uh, dry litter also makes clean out a lot more enjoyable uh, rather than having wet litter uh, that you have to scrape off the floors and uh, shovel out the barn. It's much easier to blow it out, scrape it out, um, and work with in general. Uh, another key item too, so, you know, dry litter, you know, litter depth can be an issue as well. So you really need to kind of maintain that two to three inches of litter depth, uh, which will help your mislaid eggs um, throughout your entire flock. Uh, here's a barn that we've set, showed a picture of. This has the, the proper aisle width. You can see here that the, the litter is dry, it's loose, the birds are down, and um, they're using it, they're, they're dust bathing, they're showing their natural behavior, and it leads to much more and better utilized aviary systems. This, again, the space in front of the back and in the back of the barn this is much the same as the enriched housing. You need to leave 15, 15 feet at the front, 
just to allow space for equipment, for, for maintenance, for moving those birds in and out, for, for just ease, ease of use of the barn, and 10 feet at the back of the barn around your manure drives. This allows, again, for easier cleaning of the manure system, gives you a chance when something breaks to have more room to fix it. Room above the equipment, again, we recommend a minimum of three feet of space above the top row of the housing, allowing for better airflow. Here's a layout of um, one of the aviaries that we talked about with, a, with your six feet on the outside edge of the barn and with 96 inch aisles in the middle or eight feet. This is what your barn would look like. This has the three feet above the barn and allows, and allows for better use. Um, Brian, I'll ask you to, to come in on the lighting again, please. So con controlling light inside the aviary and throughout the barn, um, it, it's a great management tool uh, to, to really affect um, the performance that you're seeing on egg quality and bird movement. Uh, you know, lighting, getting birds in and out of the system and controlling nest acceptance is very dependent on the light program and, and placement within the, within the aviary. Uh, you need certain areas bright while others need to be dark. Uh, again, we're after that dark nest. Uh, un under the system, we're after a nice bright uh, area to really discourage um, dark areas where uh, you, you may see mislaid floor eggs. Uh, color can also impact the performance. Uh, there's studies out there on red, blue, green lights, uh, all, all lights to consider you know, adding into your aviary. Um, you know, it, it's not on this slide, but spacing of lights, you know, there's 10 feet on center, 12, 16 foot, uh, you know, speak to your, your equipment manufacturer and uh, really uh, see what's best uh, recommended for, for that style of aviary. Uh, a dimming schedule is also needed each night to ensure those birds sleep on the aviary rather than the floor. This is crucial for dry litter. Um, you know, we always say if a bird sleeps on the floor, she's going to lay on the floor. So really we're after getting all those birds off the floor at, at night onto the system. So getting that sunset uh, dimming, dimming schedule is very crucial uh, in overall performance. Okay. Uh, here you can see uh, some pictures of the lighting. Um, under the system, you can see is nice and bright, discouraging the birds from getting under there and laying eggs. You can see here that the nests are also dark, like in your enriched system, encouraging them to go in and lay their eggs. Flock management. One of the things that it isn't really part of how you set up your barn, other than the aisle width and making it easy for your people to go in and out of the barns, it's important to consider the inspection of that flock and the way you walk the flock and manage the flock is incredibly important to the success of an aviary system. So we can't really go without saying it. It's something we can't talk about enough. Um, it's imp really important to make sure that you walk the flock six times a day, looking at the birds, and encouraging them not to stay on the floor and move. Um, you, you can use, there's tools that we can use, litter reduction tools that'll help. We have mislaid eggs collection that you might consider. Uh, there's system eggs in the sy system egg collection uh, that will have belts in the system. So if any are mislaid, it's an option that you can get with your equipment uh, to help collect those eggs instead of having to do it by hand. You find it quite helpful at the start until you can get those birds trained. Um, the litter reduction tools what they do is they, they help make sure that that litter stays at that two or three inches of depth that you need. And they're tools that are available, they're options, and in the long run, they pay off. When you're looking at, again, with, with our industry growing, and it's growing year after year, uh, the size of the barn today never seems to be big enough. When you order your system, talk to your, your equipment manufacturer about having expansion in mind. Think about how you can add on to that equipment. It's just not easy. With the aviaries, you can't just go up. Uh, you have to go out to make it longer. 
Um, but make sure that you have that conversation with your equipment manufacturer so that they understand that you're thinking about it in the future. Again, adding to the barn, the uh, guys from Agricon will add, will talk about that as we move forward. At this point, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna ask uh, Mark Doyle, who's the VP Global Sales Manager for Agricon, and Marty Johnson, who's our, their licensed engineering professional, to join us. And they're gonna give us uh, a presentation on what to look for in the actual barn. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, Ron, everyone can hear me? Yes. Thank you for this opportunity, um, especially the Poultry Industry Council and J.D. Williamson. We appreciate it as suppliers to be part of the presentation. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce myself and my colleague, Marty Johnson from AgriCon. We're a relatively new name in the ag industry in Canada and the U.S. We've been around for over 35 years exporting steel frame structures to developing countries and other countries around the world where lumber isn't really one of the most favorite things to discuss because of low grade lumber. We have in our uh, repertoire factories in, in engineering groups in France and in Poland and in Brazil and in Malaysia and in China. We exist in over 80 countries throughout the world and we sell primarily all steel structures. Those of us in North America and Canada and the US, um, wood framing is a secondary nature for us generally. But as I mentioned in other parts of the world, lumber is considered somewhat taboo. We have been designing steel frame structures now for livestock animal protein production for over 35 years. Our presentation today, besides talking about how to build it, also is wanting to share with you a couple of thoughts with what's recently going on in our world with lumber. In March of this year, a board foot of southern yellow pine was 40 cents a board foot here in the USA. Today, it's over 90 cents a board foot. And with the recent fires taking place in the west coast of the USA, we expect to see a wood shortage for the near future. And the length of that, there's varying degrees of understanding when that might end. We've also been faced with challenges in the US primarily with burns, fires in our structures in the past 20 months, over eight different chicken houses have burnt down in the US alone in the layer industry. We talk about foundations for our buildings and while we all know what the foundation is for the building, the foundation starts as Ron mentioned earlier with thinking about and planning about what we're going to produce inside the building. We want to take into consideration not only you, our customer, your thoughts and your wishes for the building, but we also want to take into consideration with the equipment supplier, the ventilation supplier, the concrete supplier wants, so that we can come up with a good plan and an overall basis for the foundation from the day we start the project. Once we're done with the quoting phase, and the design phase of our facilities, and we're fortunate enough to get an order, we put a basic plan together that we call a TMP, or a technical master plan. And on it, it's our depiction of how we interpret the input from you, our customer, the suppliers are, so that we all know ahead of time what that building ultimately is going to have and where the products are going to be located. We take into consideration our steel columns and how they might have an impact upon where the manure pits are located, where the rod conveyors are located, where the doors are located, control rooms are located. And we provide this 
for you as a tool and a resource to try to get everything as much as possible taken care of ahead of time. Once we have that taken care of, we then have a nice pictorial of how we anticipate the project's gonna be. And once we all agree, we can start the manufacturing of the project. While the project is being manufactured, we provide for the client and for the concrete general contractor, the anchor bolt locations for these steel columns because it is crucial to their location on the building based upon how we agreed the master plan to be. While the foundations are being put together, the reactions are being provided for the concrete people, the project is being manufactured in the various locations that we have. And once that is done and shipped, we want to ensure that the, all the equipment that we have designed for the building goes in the position that we want it to be located in. I'm going to turn this part of the presentation over to Marty. Marty is a professional engineer in the USA and certified in the design of steel trusses, similar to what we utilize in our projects. Marty's going to talk a little bit about our codes, the codes that you have in Canada, and he's also going to describe some do's and don'ts in the design phases of the buildings. Marty. Hey, hey everyone. I hope you can see me okay. I can't really see myself here. Um, I appreciate the intro, Ron and, and Mark. Um, yeah, so one of the things we, we try to um, uh, reinforce the importance of is, is code compliant and engineered designs. Um, so just in coming into the industry um, as an outsider, initially, um, I, I was witness to a lot of um, structures and buildings that were not designed properly. And by properly, I, I guess I would refer to the code specifically and, and engineered solutions, right? Um, and some of that's just been the industry in general, the transition from um, a, a, just a farming mindset to more of a large scale and um, uh, production mindset. Um, here in the U.S., we follow the International Building Code, and the um, uh, in the in your region up in Canada, you you have a similar code, the NBCC. I, I think 2015 is the current code. Um, so, you know, obviously we have some different um, loading conditions that we have to contend with. Some very high snow loads in Canada. Um, for this reason, you know, this is, these are not forgiving loads. These are things that um, are um, on the roof system and the stru main structural system for significant amounts of time. So, um, you know, those things have to be designed accordingly. Um, it's best to be, for those to be checked by an engineer um, and certified um, by someone who, who is experienced with the design. So this slide, we kind of um, kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the intent of our design. And, and for me, I, I got to back up a little bit. And um, again, as an outsider coming into the industry initially, you know, I was witness to, for me, two different kind of styles, schools of thought. One was um, just a, a simple wood pole barn style building, um, which in most cases will, some cases will meet the needs of a customer. Um, you know, basic housing of an animal, right? Um, as I, I delved into the kind of the science of it a little more, it started to become apparent that, you know, your basic farm building is really not adequate from a structural standpoint and from a, an environmental standpoint. Um, you want to have a, a thermal envelope for the animals that you're housing, if they're being affected by, you know, temperature variances or poor insulation or some sort of poor condition in the house, um, it affects production. Um, so how do you avoid that? Well, you know, there's a couple couple of ways. Um, one of them is, you know, using proprietary and, and design solutions for um, for your wall system. 
for your roof system, for the ceiling, um, for the interfaces with the building itself and the equipment. So these are all things that really need to be considered. Um, we see in the U.S. a lot um, uh, commercial style buildings that are upfitted to be ag houses. Um, in theory, this sounds good. Um, in practice, you have things, especially, you know, um, in, in very cold climates, you have thermal breaks. You, we go into these houses in, in the dead of winter and see icing where condensation is iced over. These are bad conditions for the production of, of livestock, obviously. Um, so when you're, when you're making a selection on a building system, I think it makes sense to put some real consideration, not just in the equipment side of things and the options for future expansion there, but in what makes sense from a building standpoint, housing the animals. Um, this is kind of a, uh, a sore subject for me personally. Um, a couple winters back, we had significant amounts of snowfall in, um, in the north, uh, in northeast U.S. And, um, you know, these, again, this is, uh, these buildings were designed as basic farm buildings. The trusses were probably not engineered. Um, they were out, likely outsourced. A uh, contractor came in and said, okay, this is how I'll build the wall system. I'll order this material, and then I'll order the trusses from a truss supplier. Um, which worked well for a few winters um, until the, they were placed under uh, what I would call a, a code uh, a specific event, you know, and, and you see the results here. And these are, these are actually birds in this bottom right hand uh, photograph. Um, to go out on site and to see the destruction um, that really could have been avoided with some minimal increase in design time, material, a little bit of thought and, and a, a fraction of the total project cost increase, these buildings would have lasted a significant amount of time, especially um, had they not gone with, gone with a wood structure. Um, and so, you know, again, we, we have experience with various wind loads, um, various seismic loads, various snow loads, because we've benefited from you know, being on an international stage. And I think uh, when you're selecting a design team, it's important to keep that in mind. You know, this is, um, we, we've got some some rough finishes on this house. I think the age of this this building is, is up there. Um, but this is what you want to see because this is what you do not want to see. Um, and if uh, this, this was a, a Caribbean project, I believe, and these houses were, uh, within a quarter mile of each other. Same site. Yeah, so basically the same site. Um, this was a non-engineered steel building, uh, I believe locally provided. Um, this was a, a, a properly engineered building under the same conditions. Total loss. Um, another thing you want to consider here, and I'll try to, try to jump around if I can. Another thing you want to consider is, you know, what what is your team using to design your systems? How how are they coming up with the solutions that they are proposing? Um, you've got significant costs now that are going into a project. Um, for me, you know, coming from the engineering profession, it has always made sense and paid off to really take a hard look during the planning phase, spend a little more time up front, spend a little more invest just a bit more, um, uh, use the modern tools um, that, that we have within not just our industry, but just in the, um, in, in uh, what I would call just um, parallel industries, right? And I think it's important to make sure, you know, sometimes um, when you're making a selection of your team, you know, to, to perhaps go with uh, ones that have more experience, but also have a, a, a skill set that can be helpful, you know, to your team. I think it really can add value, right? Um, you know, this is a, an example here, and if I could get this thing to stop wrestling with me. Um, this gives you modern tools, can give you the ability to check and coordinate um, 
your ventilation, with your equipment, with your building, with your foundation, there are a lot of moving parts in modern projects. And um, if you do not spend the time to coordinate those up front, you will pay for it later. Um, and I, I hate to see um, people invest in a lot of time, energy, and effort into systems only to find out that they should have done that a little more early on. Let's see from current. Okay. And then so so you know that's part of why we recommend you know if you have a, a, a team working together that you have you know skilled professionals that, that are familiar with their uh, with their job and, and like Ron said in the beginning that are all involved from the start to come up with to work towards a center common goal on uh, the optimum solution. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Marty. Um, I'll take over for a few more minutes and then Marty's going to finish up our presentation this afternoon. Um, I did fail to mention one thing earlier and I apologize, but please feel free to ask any questions of any of the pro pro uh, providers that are given the presentations here today. I was reminded that we should remind you of that and we'd appreciate doing that. Um, taking over from the engineering phase and the design phase, now we're into the real heart of the matter, the construction phase. From the time that the building arrives at the job site, we'd like to have input as to how and where the components go in the building. We feel it's very important um, to make sure that there's a site set aside for the staging of the material. One of the ways to minimize confusion and construction errors is to have good access to all the material at the job site. Oftentimes, everyone is in such a hurry to get a container unloaded because we typically only have three to four hours to unload containers that we fail to pre-plan where the product needs to be placed so we can grab it efficiently during the construction phase of the project. We spend time with our site supervisors and project managers, with the general contractor and the customer to make sure that the minuscule ideas of staging properly are taking place. Once the buildings arrived, we start with obviously the construction and we work right with the concrete and the erectors for the building to make sure that the columns that we utilize are put in a proper place with the proper leveling and that when we put our skin on we have a nice tight seal. Marty touched on this a little bit ago but I'd like to just reinforce it. Our buildings are designed for the production of protein whether it be eggs or meat, it is designed for agricultural applications. We are not a warehouse company and we don't adapt a warehouse design. We design for protein production. We take great strides in making sure that we eliminate any possible air infiltration points on our footing and our foundations. We'll get into the track that you see on the right uh, in a little bit, uh, my cursor is not working, sorry. Um, in addition to working with the footings and making sure that we have a nice tight seal, we always want to make sure that the concrete people have used the right type of anchor bolts. There's cast in place anchor bolts, there's epoxy coated anchor bolts, and there's swedged anchor bolts, and all our acceptable methods if the right size units are actually designed. In our colder climates, especially for those of you from Canada we're talking today, strongly recommend to have insulated footings for that exposed portion above the ground and below the ground. As you can see here, this particular client put the insulation on the exterior of the building, not on the interior concrete. This happens to be a project in southwestern Michigan that's under construction presently. You can see what early August where we had just a concrete pad 
And I believe when we say mid-September, this was around the 15th or 16th of September, how much work had transpired on that particular project. This happens to be a two-room project with 130,000 plus layers in each side of Cage Free. As I mentioned, the building was designed for protein production. We feel very strongly of doing our homework ahead of time and making sure that the ease of erection is such that we can get a building up in a time frame that surpasses those of lumber buildings. Our buildings are pre-engineered, pre-cut and pre-punched with holes and slots so that all you have to do is bolt the building together in lieu of having to weld the building together. Everything you see on this building is bolted. The buildings can be erected with sky tracks. Um, the buildings can be erected with cherry pickers. The buildings can be erected with cranes. It's very light gauge angular steel that we utilize for these projects. We believe in flat ceilings. We believe in straight walls. And the reason why we design flat ceilings is one, we can get a nice cross-sectional area in the building, give you the right height above the cages as Ron and Brian spoke about earlier. And more importantly, we put a ceiling in with a vapor barrier and we can put unlimited amounts of ceiling insulation in the building. Over 72% of the heat loss in these structures today go through the ceiling. You cannot get enough insulation in the attics of these buildings. The higher the R value or the resistance value, the less heat loss you're going to have in the winter time and the less heat gain that you're gonna have in the summertime. Um, we provide a gal hot dip galvanized steel main structure. Our columns and our trusses are all hot dip galvanized after they've been punched or bored and welded at our production facilities. We utilize cold form galvanized for our secondary framing. A new concept that it might be new to some of you people listening today is the utilization of IMP or insulated metal panels on the building. The panel is a layer of metal on the exterior, polyurethane foam in the middle, and a layer of metal on the interior. The panels can be two inches, three inches, four inches, or greater in thickness. The panels have an R value of approximately 7.5 per inch thickness of the panel. So if you have a three inch panel, you have an R of 21. This is comparable to a six inch wall with R19 fiberglass in the six inch wall. The panel typically mounts on the inside of the building and it's a tongue and groove design with a gasket in the middle that seals the panel when we put them together in the tongue and groove fixture. There's a track at the bottom, a track at the top of the sidewall, and those are our two primary mounting points. Depending on the height of the sidewall, we may have some intermediate mounting points to also attach it with. These panels go together extremely rapidly and it makes for a faster construction of your building and allowing the cages to be installed. This is a typical exterior view of the panels with the columns exposed and the panels being on the inside of the building. In addition to designing the building for the application that it's being used for, we do take into consideration that there are some types of structures where the conventional style design is also 
mandated, shall I say, or uh, desired by the producer. And in this case, they opted to go with skin on the outside to protect the columns compared to the previous photo I showed you. Um, we've utilized, you know, agricultural grade galvanized based panel. We do not use galvalum or aluma zinc panels. We typically stick with, shall we say, galvanized because it's designed more for the environment, such as the ammonia buildup or the litter coming in contact with the panels, if there is any such thing. This is a dog house or inlet for fan, inlets for inside of the building. We provide all the framing for the fans. And as was mentioned previously, you know, when we work with the equipment and ventilation company, all of our material is designed for the rough opening size for the fans. So the framing for the fans, the trim for the fans, are all included in the pre-packaged unit that we take care of for these projects. Our inlet framing typically is done such that we provide a nice tight seal around the air inlets. We wanna make sure that the air comes in through the hoods in this case and not around the perimeter of the inlet where we don't have any control in the winter time. This is just an idea of some of the different width structures. This particular structure is 170 feet wide. As I mentioned, it was a two room design. The panels are on the inside of this building. This is the end wall going up and the way that the fans are installed in very short order on this building. This is an interior look utilizing the IMP panels. Again, very smooth, very laminar design so the air flows as efficiently as possible crosswise in the house and lengthwise in the house during summertime in tunnel conditions in this particular building's instance. This is a typical end wall design utilizing um, the IMP panel that we discussed. As you can see, we make the recesses where applicable for the air drying blowers. The end sets, as you can see, and the manure end of the house is being is installed. A nice tight seal around the fans to give, again, the minimization of air leakage in the building except through the air inlets where it was designed to come in. This is the air inlets from the inside being installed. You can see a rail for the, in this particular case, it's two levels, so there'll be a walkway. This is the finished upper level. a finished lower level. And important part of the building of, are the end sets that come in for multiple sectional use. I'm gonna have Marty take over right here and talk a little bit about the pros and the cons of end sets and the utilization of them and continue on in the presentation, Marty. Thanks, Mark. So I think um, those of you that may not have experience with a multi-level house may not be too familiar with this, but this, this would be the end structure to continue the upper level flooring. The upper level flooring in the main part of the house would be part of the cage system um, supported on the sidewall by a, by a rail and uh, supported at the ends by this ancillary inset deck structure. Um, for me, though, the, the importance here lies in um, the coordination of the different equipment and trades. Um, it, what it demonstrates for me is that you've got an equipment supplier who has a limited um, 
scope. He's got a limited range of uh, product that he's offering. Uh, the ventilation as well. Um, the electrician, you know, the, the skilled trades bringing in plumbing. Um, the coordination of these things for me is what is important. Um, oftentimes, specifically here in the U.S., uh, specifically in steel buildings as well, you will have a, a steel building supplier who will provide a, a shell, um, uh, and and that really is the extent of what they're willing to provide. So there will be missing components. And if you look in this photo at the top, there's a, the recess in the ceiling Mark mentioned. Um, the, they're framing members for mounting of, of ventilation fans. That's not something a typical building supplier would want to get involved with. And, and that's when you end up depending on your contractor come in and, and fill in those gaps. These inset decks are another um, another area that um, oftentimes you'll see uh, that are just overlooked or not a whole lot of thought is put into them. Um, when you're in the field doing completing the project, these become very large cost items because they haven't been focused on the details, haven't been coordinated. Um, scope maybe doesn't isn't doesn't have any continuity. And so if these things are coordinated, what you ultimately end up with is a is a, a well planned, well fitting system. And, and so for here, you know, as an as an owner, I would look at this um, through the lens of long term use, um, a little bit of painstaking attention to detail and planning up front means that, you know, my farm managers aren't tripping over the same system, constantly reaching in an unsafe way to a certain location, um, having to move carts in a certain direction or, or uh, egress in a way that's, that's just a pain in the butt on site. And so we try to approach our designs using the tools that we have and the experience that we bring um, to bring all of this together for the, for the benefit of the long-term use of the, the, of the project. Um, here's um, an example of kind of um, where we've been able to pull on this breadth of knowledge and experience we have uh, to produce things that are outside of simply the bird room and give a full solution um, for the production process. And um, in this example is that we have a manure room um, and they're trying to, you know, using a, a proper ventilation system and equipment system, get the, uh, obtain the moisture levels that they need, um, move the manure efficiently, and then remove it from the bill, store it and remove it efficiently. Um, and again, it comes down to coordination and, and planning up front from all parties. Um, another service just on our end that we offer is, is the ability to, um, tackle, you know, other systems, coolers, hatcheries, processing facilities, probably a little too fast on that one. Egg rooms, various sizes, spans. Um, and I, um, aside, even when we are in, working on projects that don't involve these type of structures, I think our experience, um, with them brings, it definitely brings something to the table. Um, Mark, I'm not sure if you want to talk a little bit about these um, cage-free well, components. Be, uh, being that we're talking about aviaries and enriched systems, I thought it would be interesting to show uh, in other parts of the world where we've had some success and some sales of some other basic cage-free type designs. Um, we have those, of course, with the pop-out doors, as you can see here in these photographs. And just on a sidebar note, uh, this project happens to be in New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken. They actually still utilize curtains as part of their building, um, which we typically don't get too involved with, but we can do it. I believe this is a project in Australia, probably very similar to what uh, Big Dutchman and J.D. Williamson are talking about 
but in other parts of the world, they have very similar type buildings. And we just wanted to share some of our thoughts and hopefully successes with them. Um, with that, I'd like to tell you, thank you again for the time to allow Marty and I talk. And I believe now JD is going to be taking over. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay, sure. uh, I'm going to start here uh, uh, and pick up with uh, the egg room design. So when we're building a barn, of course, uh, one of the most important parts is the egg room design. And there's a lot that goes into that. So there's a lot of things you want to consider. The first thing to consider would be your bird numbers. Um, how much time do you want to spend packing? There's uh, lots of other jobs to do on the farm. Packing is one of them, but you've got to figure out how much time you want to spend actually doing the packing. When you're laying out that packing room, um, oftentimes a mistake that I see a lot of producers make is they don't give themselves enough room. And uh, one thing I hear time and time again is, boy, I wish I'd built it bigger. Uh, and it's always kind of hard to, to imagine how much room you truly are gonna need. But that emphasizes uh, Ron's point that uh, right from the beginning, it's really good to pull in experts from all fields um, and get lots of input because sometimes there's things that you wouldn't think of that uh, once everything's done and dusted, you go, oh, geez, you know, I wish, wish I could have gone back and done that a little differently. Um, another thing to consider is the level of automation you want in your packing room. Uh, that's something that's changing very rapidly. Uh, as we see different types of tray types coming into the industry, it makes it possible for uh, things like robotics uh, that we never saw on the horizon for eggs um, being very possible now in the uh, very near future. Uh, also ease of use, the product flow. So you wanna make sure you have a good flow of your materials. You wanna be able to bring dry materials into the room, have them staged close to the packers to fill those denesters. And then you wanna have a nice product flow so that they're not in the way when you're taking those full skids of eggs out and bringing them back into the cooler. So we'll go through some typical uh, packing room designs to show you uh, how that all fits in. And the other thing is uh, different rooms, washrooms, biosecurity rooms, egg coolers, mechanical, electrical rooms, all those things are to be considered too. And then a big thing when we talk about robotics is ceiling height because you've got to have a little bit higher of a ceiling to achieve uh, those robotics. So their first slide here shows a typical floor plan. This was a customer uh, in Ontario who uh, had a very good sized room. Uh, so they had a lot of options open to them. Uh, now, if you follow my mouse throughout this presentation, I'm going to be kind of going through these slides and you just want to keep track of where the mouse is. So over here, this is the, the barn would be coming up this way from the top to the bottom. And then this hole in the wall here is where the conveyor would pop through. And this open space in here is where we want to do the packing. And in this case, the customer has this square here, which they wanted to have a pneumatic lift. Now this customer, they chose to do their build in a couple of phases. They, they did want to put robotics in. They weren't able to put them in right at the beginning just because of uh, some different details there, but they knew in about five to 10 years, they would want to add robotics. So we had to make sure we had the space there, the ceiling height, the floor strength, all these things uh, in line uh, before, we, before we started. So this is their basic floor plan. Uh, the front entrance is at the bottom here and they have this biosecurity area if you want to enter into the barn, you come through here. You've got a bathroom where you can shower in, shower out if you had to, and then you gain access to the full packing room. Uh, the egg cooler is in the top left here. And this is, uh, this is a really big detail. You want to make sure that you build your egg cooler big enough, uh, of course, to keep all your eggs. Now, you're going to want to consult with your egg grader on how often they'll come to pick up the eggs. And you want to make sure you have enough room for that. And in Ontario and in all of Canada, you really got to make sure you have room in case there's bad weather and you might not be able to get a pickup. A lot of these farms are a bit off the beaten track and sometimes you can just get snowed in. And you've got to make sure you have a couple extra days for either holidays or bad weather. Always, again, build it bigger. Bigger is better. And then as we follow on to the top right, you see there's a water room where they might have their boiler and everything like that located. Uh, an electrical room. Oftentimes, you'll have a large backup generator in here. And just one thing to think about, some of these electric generators, um, they have a, a time test period every day where they'll, they'll start just to test. If you're going to do that, a lot of the packing equipment is very sensitive. And if you had a, a generator that's turning off and on, you can have spikes and lows in the electricity. So it's better to make that, to have that time for a time when you're not running your packer. We'll go to the next slide here. And so this customer, they gave us that drawing and we came back. At first we were looking at uh, a diamond 
uh, farm packer here. This is a 100 case diamond in this area here with a left hand discharge. So that's a conveyor belt going off to the left with a tray stacker right in here. Plenty of room for it. That was just the first option. They took a look at that, the distance between the packer and the uh, pneumatic lift. And then we also gave them an option for a MOBA 100 case farm packer. So down here, we have the eggs coming into the room. We have a, a slight little uh, extension in the packer here. The eggs come in, the trays are denested in this area, and everything goes around through the tray stacker. Out they come here. This is the layout we eventually went with. I think the, the scissor lift never did go in in the end, but um, we kept it open here. You might think, boy, there's a lot of open space, but that's because, again, the future plan was to have this room looking like this, where the eggs come in and all we had to change is the conveyor coming out of the packer, the tray stacker now going from south to north, coming around in here, and in this red square, that's our robot cell. So that's a safety fence that we place around our robots. Um, if for any reason that fence was open during production, everything shuts off. Um, now, in this case, what's nice is you have uh, an area to put your dry goods in here. So you come in in the morning and you'd stack up a, a few pallets and you'd stack up a few dividers. And uh, what the robot will do is it'll just pick up the eggs from this point here, place them on the pallet, grab a divider when it needs it. And then that pallet over here will be moved down and another pallet will be placed here. And the machine never has to stop. You could collect all your eggs and gradually those eggs will just sort of roll out of the robot cell here on their own. And then all the operator has to do is take them from here with their uh, fork truck and bring them across here into the cooler. And in this case, you can see where we recommended that they 90 off this wall here, or sorry, uh, put that wall on a 45 degree angle to give them room to get in the cooler door and it works pretty well. One thing to consider is your egg conveyors. Your egg conveyors obviously bring the eggs from the barn into the packing room. And there's a few considerations uh, that you have to take into account when you're laying these out. Uh, the first would be the curve. So if you're going to have a 90 degree curve, which I always recommend, if you need to get your eggs moved uh, 90 degrees to enter a packer, it's much better if you have room to put a 90 degree curve rather than doing a belt to belt transfer. The curve is just effortless. The, uh, the eggs glide along and there's just no pressure on the eggs whatsoever. When you have to make a 90 degree transfer from one belt to another, there can be a little bit of pressure buildup between the eggs, depending on your volume. Uh, it's always safer and better in my, in my opinion to go with a, a 90 degree bend. But you gotta make sure you have room enough for these beds. So we sell the lubing conveyor. It's a very typical conveyor. I think it's uh, widely available throughout the country. And uh, if you're gonna have a 20 inch conveyor, which is pretty much the standard, it's six feet, six inches is required to make that bend. The next consideration would be inclines or declines. Um, a lot of times now you'll see that the discharge in the barn for the conveyors is up overhead, which is nice because that gives you the option when you're loading and unloading birds to get underneath that with your bird carts. Um, so typically we'll see something like somewhere in the area of 90 inches uh, discharge height. Well then now you've got to bring these eggs into the packing room and depending if you're at dock height or if you're not at dock height, or how close your packer is to that wall, you've got to make sure that you give yourself enough room to bring those eggs down gently. Uh, general rule of thumb is three to one. So for every foot that you need to go up or down, you need to go out three feet. Uh, and that just gives a nice gentle, uh, gentle motion for the eggs. There's not gonna have any eggs tumbling over top of, of each other and you won't have any mess on your hands. Accumulators. Uh, accumulators are something, if you are going to be packing more than one barn in a single packing room, you're going to need an accumulator. The reservoir, which is the area right in here where the eggs come in on any packer is generally 20 inches wide. Um, an accumulator placed in front of there, will, you'll need to have that if you're gonna be collecting from two barns. And in this case, you can see you'd have eggs coming from barn A up here, making a curve, and eggs coming from barn B, making the curve. And in this case, for the customer, we told them, give yourself that six and a half feet plus, and a, and a good straightaway section for the drives of the conveyor, and then into the packer they go. And on the right, you see a little picture here of a typical um, accumulator. And all we do is just narrow those eggs in as gently as possible uh, to get them into a six wide egg packer. Um, 
the more length you have to do this, the better. If you have a large volume of eggs, the more room you, uh, you can give that accumulator, the better. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, four by four is pretty standard. Uh, six by six I've seen. I've even seen some eight by eights. Uh, if you've got the room for it, it's just longer guides, it's gentler, and it uh, gives those uh, eggs a little more time to get in line. The next thing would be uh, selecting your packer and planning for what kind of packer you do need. Um, of course, this goes back to my, my first point of how much time you want to spend in the barn. Um, typically, a 70 case per hour packer, it's rated at 25,000 eggs per hour. That's if it's full all the time, uh, full supply, and it never stops. Well, that's usually not the way barns in Canada run. Um, with our numbers, a lot of times the packer will kind of sit there until it's got its six eggs and then it advances. Uh, so typically we like to say that 70 case per hour really usually runs somewhere around 18,000 eggs per hour. Um, and that's, you know, it can vary, but it's somewhere around that number. And then you also have uh, a hundred case packer, which is rated at 36,000 eggs per hour. Um, but again, most likely it's gonna run somewhere around that 32,000 eggs per hour. Uh, in all in all reality here. So just a couple of different ways of doing it. You've got the diamond on your left and a MOBA on your right. Two different ways of achieving the same thing. Now you'll see these packers here are shown with tray stackers. Tray stackers are great because it does give the operator um, time uh, to spend looking at the flow of the eggs coming in. You see here this control box. Uh, in this case, the, the operator would stand right here and their job would be just to keep an eye on what is coming in. If there's any kind of foreign material, they got a chance to get it out. Um, they're very close to the denester to put uh, trays in there to keep it fed. And you just let that packer and stacker do its work and it will just slowly jog out the stacks of eggs. And once those stacks make it all the way to the end, a sensor there will pick up that it's full and everything stops. The operator can then lift the eggs off, starting closest to the stacker, working their way back. And when they get to the end and they pick up that last stack, the sensor will see that there's nothing there anymore. And again, it'll all start again. So it's a really nice way to ensure that you are where you should be and keeping, uh, keeping control of your egg quality. Here we have uh, an example of diamond case, diamond uh, farm packers, uh, 70 and 100 case per hour machines and the layouts. So as you can see here, we do a left hand 90 degree down below that right hand 90 degree those are probably i'd say 75 percent of the time or more that's that's usually what you're going to find um, and then next we'd go to the far right here where we have our left and right with a tray stacker that's that box right here and that's if you want to add that tray stacker you get a little wider so the width with a stacker is about 15 feet and tip to tail you're looking at about eight feet and without the stacker over here tip to tail you're still eight feet but side to side, you're about 10 feet. And then also another option is to do 180 degrees. And if you don't have room left to right, you see these oftentimes. This one here is shown without a stacker. So the trays would come not stacked up and the operator would have to spend a lot of time back here where they would be sorting those trays out. But again, it leaves you vulnerable to anything coming in. You just don't have your eyes on it. So the stacker, uh, a lot of time, it's, uh, it's a big saver in case something was to get stuck or jammed in there. And again, we can do that 180 degrees left or right with a tray stacker. That will lead us into robotics. Um, robotics on the farm are something that we're gonna start to see more and more, I think. Um, and our company, we carry uh, two different kinds of robotics, both brought to you by MOBA. On the right is the MOBA machine, which is a typical robot. When you think of a robot, that's sort of what you think of. Um, something you might see in, a, in an automobile factory. And on the left is the Cobot Megbot. And this is a, a different way of doing it. It's a smaller, more compact uh, layout. And uh, it doesn't take the ceiling uh, height that the MOBA takes. And it just uses actuators actually to come in there and pick up the eggs. And then up and down they travel back and forth. And it's really pretty neat, both, both options. So we'll take a look at them more in, in more detail. Um, first, I'm just gonna show you on the MOBA some of the things we do now. I'm gonna actually slide back, uh, show you here one of our 3D drawings. This helps to illustrate a little more um, where the operator would stand on a MOBA. You'd stand right here at the front as the eggs come in this yellow belt. Your denester is right here to keep loaded. You probably have a pallet of trays just sitting right here. So you can quickly load that denester. And then once this conveyor fills up with trays, 
walk over and you place them on your scissor lift, which uh, in this case will probably be moved a little bit closer to the packer. Typically, we wanna see about four feet between the edge of any pneumatic lift and the side of the packer. You want to have enough room for an operator to fully turn around with a stack of eggs so they're not doing that bending and twisting motion, which can actually end up hurting your back a little more. So that's, that's with, without a, sorry, a robot. And then in the case of the robot, as I was mentioning before, you have your eggs coming in here, the trays come out here, you go through the tray stacker, now you're fully stacked around the corner, and the robot will pick these eggs up four at a time, place them down onto the waiting pallet, and then pick up any dividers it needs from here. It's got spare pallets located in here. And then once this thing is full, it simply rolls out on its own for the operator to take it into the cooler. Okay, so this is the Cobot Megbot. And uh, this is a really compact unit. It's about an eight by eight box. Um, so it can get into most packing rooms, which is really nice. It's a more affordable option than the, uh, the typical robot sold by MOBA. Um, and it's, it's really great the way it works. I'm going to show you a video after, but it doesn't require the same ceiling height. Uh, if you're only going five layers high, which we do in Canada, you're only going to need about eight and a half feet. So if you have a nine foot ceiling, you're going to be able to get this in there. And uh, as opposed to the 10 and a half feet that you would need uh, for ceiling clearance on a MOBA. I'm going to skip to the video now, show you how that works. So we'll just watch here and you can see the operator comes in. In the case of the Cobot, it's a little more manual. So you bring in the pallet yourself and all the layer pads are kept stacked above. And then you have your eggs going through your machine. I'm going to fast forward a bit. And now you see an angle here, the egg making the turn, going into the tray stacker. That final stack coming out. And now the cobot engages. And it's lining up to get in the right spot. And with the actuators, it's drawing back. It finds the position on the pallet and lowers. Now these systems here, this Cobot system will keep up with either a 70 case per hour packer or a 100 case per hour packer. The uh, MOBA, the more true robot MOBA will handle up to 200 cases an hour. So you could have two 100 packers and that robot would be able to grab eggs from both of them and pack onto a single pallet or, or two pallets depending on how you wanted it organized. I'm just going to skip ahead again to this mark. And here you can see full layers completed. It simply goes up, grabs a divider that you've already preloaded in the morning. I think we can fit up to 12 up there. And depending on ceiling height, maybe a little more, 12 or 16. And down it'll come to place it on top. And then our next portion of the video, we'll see the last stack going on. It's very smooth motion, as you see. It's not no jerking or shuddering. It's very smooth, these actuators, the way they work. Over they come. And the whole time, you can see over here, just in the corner, nothing is stopping. Those eggs are still coming through. We're keeping up with the capacity. And there's no buildup of eggs. And then out go the forks. And we're cleared. So that's just a little bit on, on how those work. And at this time, we'll, uh, we'll bring it back to, uh, to Ron if there's any questions. 
and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, JD. We really appreciate that. And thank you to, uh, to Mark, Marty, and, and to Bryant as well for taking the time to, to share their knowledge with us today. Um, at this point, we'd open it up for questions. If you have any questions, uh, there's a button on the bottom for Q&A. Just type them in and we'll be happy to get it to the right person. Uh, there's um, one question, Ron. Sure. <clears throat> Somebody asked the question about the feeder space. You had mentioned that it's uh, 2.8 and they were wondering right. if that was correct. That 2.8 is correct. My error in the slide at 3.9 was incorrect. I apologize. Okay. One other person um, asked, uh, and they did, they did preface it by saying it may not be able to be answered at this uh, webinar, but they said, what, what considerations should I have when moving to a cage system to enriched? And, and the question is relating to um, building, whether to build new or retrofitting their current building. What kind of considerations should they, where, where would they start when considering this? Well, I, when, I, I think I'll take this one if that's okay. Um, when, when you're looking at the barns that you have, there's a couple things that you need to take into, it, into account if you're trying to renovate the barn that you have. A lot of our older barns don't have enough ceiling height to, we have to, you need over eight and a half feet to get three tiers of cages, of enriched cages into a barn. So because you need more head space than our conventional cages, you end up needing more space. That 17.7 .7 inches plus the manure belts really does restrict. So that's one of the things to look at. What I'd have you do is call, um, we'd be happy to help out or uh, call your equipment supplier and, and work with them on what you can get into your existing barn and see if that can cover your needs and how many birds you can get in there. And then they can work with you and tell you how big a barn you're gonna to need to, to meet your goals if you're looking at new. And then it'll simply become a cost evaluation from there. But the, you, do rec you are gonna get less birds in a barn because of the extra space required per bird than you would have got in your old conventional cages. Happy to help out if we, if we can in any way if somebody wants to contact us after the webinar. <laughs> And Ron, if I could, if I could just add one additional amount of, from a historical standpoint, uh, when you do look at conversing, and if you do have sufficient headspace as you're talking about, it's a real good time to look at how the insulation is in the attic over space. Over time, typically buildings that don't have like cellulose insulation or P, PU insulation some of the insulation breaks down and it'd be a very good time to look at re-insulating those ceilings because again, as we said, over 72% of the heat loss is through the ceiling. And if you're gonna convert an existing barn, it never hurts to put more insulation in the ceiling. The uh, addition to the question, uh, the question also went on, I should say, to uh, cage free and uh, I don't know if you want to add to that or not, converting, converting from cage to cage free or enriched to cage free. Again, um, what you need to look at is how many birds you can get into that space and whether it meets your needs. So I'd suggest probably contacting an equipment supplier, hopefully us, um, and having them and sit down and see, work with the space, have us come out and do a measurement and work with the space and see how many, bar, how many birds we can get into that space and see whether that meets your needs. And like, you, and like Mark said, and that that's the time to do any upgrades you need to either electrically or, or for insulation as well. All right, well, that is all the questions. All right, well, again, thank you very much for taking your time to be with us today. We, we really appreciate you being here and, and share, and, um, uh, help letting us share our knowledge with you. Um, starting in, we'll, early December, we'll be doing uh, our next installment in, in our webinar series. So we'd ask you to, to keep your eye on the, the PIC and the uh, Big Dutchman websites uh, for that announcement. And thank you very much for being here today. I'd like to thank 
uh, Mark Doyle, uh, Marty Johnson, J.D. Williamson, and Bryant Wiley, as well as the people from PIC for being uh, excellent hosts for us today. And have a great day, everyone. And thanks for being here again. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining.